But here on earth, I've got a dad that is a better dad than, than blood could, could give me. I promise you that. If I met him today, he, could, he, couldn't, hold, he couldn't hold an inch to the father on, on, on earth that I have. And I'm proud to say that. So you men that may not believe, be a blood father, I appreciate you for what you do for these young men and young women in this room. And guys in this room, go be the dad you're called to be. You carry huge influence. Huge influence. Be a part of your son or daughter's life. Or that lost child that's in your area. Be a part of their life. Give back, okay? Because all we have is each other. We've got a treat today. This is Warren Morris. He's a, he's a local hero here. LSU, uh, I don't want to give it all of it, LSU baseball team won the uh, College World Series in 1996. Got a walk-off homer here and uh, you know we're, we're very, very proud to have you here, Warren, to, to kind of give us your insight and just speak from your heart. I, we didn't give him any agenda. I told him it was about Dad's Day and I wanted him to speak, speak from his heart. But let me just share a little bit about myself. Um, I grew up right here in, in Alexandria, went to high school at Bolton High School. Um, played basketball, baseball, and uh, got an opportunity beyond my dreams, really, to go play baseball at the college level. Um, you have to know this about me. I'm not a big guy, but in high school, I was a lot smaller than this. And really, I honestly can tell you, I would have never got the opportunity to do the things beyond if I hadn't really competed and do the best I could in the classroom. You see, I went to LSU on an academic scholarship. I never had any kind of athletic scholarship. So without that, I never would have had that opportunity. That opportunity led to me having the chance to play at LSU, play on two national championship teams. Beyond that, to play, on, represent my country in the Olympics. 1996, I was on the Olympic baseball team to win a bronze medal. And then from there, I got to play professional baseball for nine years. You know, I almost had to pinch myself. I said, wait a minute, you're going to pay me to play the same game I've been playing since I was a kid? Yeah, sign me up. I'll do that. Um, so I got to play in the big leagues for around four years with Pittsburgh Pirates, Detroit Tigers, Minnesota Twins. And, you know, I, I can remember sitting in, you know, banquets and, and, and places and hear people talk. And I always thought, you know, those people you see on TV, you know, they got to be from like Los Angeles or Chicago, big places. I never thought somewhere little like the middle of Louisiana, somebody could do all these things. But I think God had a plan. So, uh, you know, he used me. I don't know why, but I just, I think part of that plan was for me to share the story and, and hopefully you can get something from it. Um, I don't want you to think it was always, you know, an easy road. It wasn't always a, a straight shot to the, to the good things that happened. Um, like I told you, I wasn't the biggest kid going into college. And uh, here's a story. Very first meeting that we had at LSU, I'm sitting in the room, Coach Skip Berkman, maybe one of the greatest baseball, college baseball coaches of all time, was out in front. He's leading the, the team, talking about, you know, the things coaches talk about in that first meeting. This is our goals. This is what we want to do. We want to win a national championship, do all these things. And as he's talking, I'm listening, but I'm also looking around and the first thing that I noticed is, man, these guys are so much bigger. I mean, it's, it looks more like a football team than a baseball team. And, and I see this one guy on the other side of the room, he's my size. So I'm thinking, well, I guess we can relate. So once the meeting's over, we break up, I kind of go over to that guy, and just ex uh, exchange pleasantries. And you know, I get to the question of, hey man, what position do you play? And he kind of looks at me funny, he's like, I'm the equipment manager. <laughs> Before the very first practice or anything, I knew I had my work cut out for me, and uh, I did. The things that nobody ever saw, the things that don't get, you don't get to see when you go to the games and sit in the stands in front of all the people cheering and uh, the victories and all that, but I had to, you know, get a lot stronger, go to the weight room and, and lift weights when nobody else was there, hit in the cages, have to turn the lights on, everybody else has gone home, but I did all those things just for the opportunity to play. and. Uh, you know, did well, got to play. That was the, my first year. I didn't play at all red-shirted, but I was on the squad. The following year, had an All-American, Todd Walker, that played in front of me. So I didn't get to play my normal position of infield, but I played in the outfield. And, uh, you know, I got in there. The next year, I had a good year. I was able to play second base and got an opportunity to play on the USA national team that summer. Traveled around with the best 
college players from all over. And that gave me a lot of confidence. So that led into 1996, and that's kind of what the story I want to tell you about. That year started off, and you know, I, I for the first time had a lot of honors and accolades come my way. I was named a preseason All-American and all these great things, and I started to think, well, you know what? I, we didn't do so well last year. You think LSU at that time used to go to the College World Series every year, but we didn't even make the College World Series, and I felt like this was our chance to do something for our class. And I said, you know what? I'm going to be one of the leaders on this team and you know, lead us to the promised land, if you will. And uh, you know, the season starts off, and about 20 games in, I hit a ball off the end of my bat, and somehow it goes through for a base hit. I get to first base, and something didn't feel right. You know, my hand couldn't really squeeze it too well. We end up, we, we scored. I scored the run, and I think we batted around. So I had to bat again. We must have been playing Tulane or somebody like that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I go up there to hit, and uh, I, I just, I, 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 it didn't feel right. I, I couldn't really swing. It, it felt, my hand felt real weak. So I ended up, I think I couldn't really get the bat off my shoulders, and I strike out. And that led to a month of not playing. I mean, I went to different hand specialists, x-rays. I did everything you could think of. They couldn't really find anything, so they said, you know what? You just have some kind of ligament issue, so just rest it, and it'll get better. So after that month is over, I give it another shot. This next time, it's even worse than before. I mean, uh, my hands bother me so much. Like I go to class just to take notes and I, I can't even really write very well. You know, it's just, everything's hurting. So they say, let's take another month off. Still more tests, everything. Can't really figure out what the issue is. Well, this is like two months. I mean, the whole baseball season is only about four or five months. Two of those months that I had all these plans to lead us to you know, glory, I'm not even playing. And that's when it kind of hit me one day. And that, that one day is what I look back today whenever I face trials and situations because that's when it all turned around for me. You see, I finally realized, you know, I kind of gotten to the point to where I, I started to think I was doing all this stuff. You know, I had grown up in church and I, I knew I was a Christian. I was baptized in early age, but I'd almost gotten to the point to where, you know what, I was had all these great things and it was me doing it. And I think God used that tool of that injury to kind of tap me on the shoulder and say, hey, you know what, you might need me to lead the way in this. So that day that turned it around for me, I got down on my knees in my bed and nobody's there, closed the door and I prayed this prayer. I said, God, I don't know what you have in store for me. I don't know if you want me to finish school and do something totally unrelated to sports. If that's what you want, I'll do it. And I'll give you all the glory. But I don't know if you want me to continue playing baseball and, you know, go that path, but I'll do that too. But I, I'm not going to worry about it anymore. It's all yours. And from that point forward, it was like somebody took a load of bricks off my back. I didn't worry about it. In fact, a few days later, I remember people coming up to me and asking me, man, how are you dealing with this? What, what do you think is going to happen? I mean, because baseball is kind of what I did, and I couldn't do it. And I told them. I said, it's going to be okay. You'll see. Everything's going to work out. Because it wasn't mine anymore. And sure enough, a few days after I prayed that prayer, they said, hey, we want you to go take this other test at the hospital. They did that, and the radiologist called me, and he said, look at this. You've got a broken bone in your hand. You haven't seen it all along. Well, I was the happiest person in the world to know I had a broken bone, because at least I knew there was something they could do about it. But there was still a little bit of risk involved, because we only had 27 days until our playoffs, the regional, started. Now, the coach did some, some research, called around in some big league places. It's kind of a common injury. It's right here at the base of your, your wrist called the hemate bone. I've broken it. All they do is they go in, take the broken piece out, and you just wait for the healing for your scar to heal. But everybody's different in, as far as their healing. They called, and in one, one place they said Jose Canseco had this. It took him 60 days to come back. Called somebody else. They said, uh, you know, Ken Griffey Jr. had it. Take, it took him 36 days. I had 27 days until the first game. I might have this, have this uh, surgery and still not be able to make it back in time for that season. But I said, you know what? If God meant it to be, then we'll give it a shot, see what happens. So sure enough, 27 days after that surgery, we had our first game. I was nowhere near 100%. I was probably closer to 50%, but I was able to get in there. I could throw, I could kind of make it through just punching at the ball. But I was in there. Man, I was so happy to be in there. I think the fans, everybody was glad I was back. First at bat, I pop up, and I got a standing ovation. Maybe the first person in history to get a standing ovation on the pop-up. But I was just glad to be back in there. And 
we won that game, we kept winning, and we made it to the College World Series. Now, don't forget this too though, whenever I was back in there, I was batting ninth in the lineup, and it's not T-ball, so you don't put your best hitter bat batting last. So, you know, I, I was in there, but it wasn't like I was the key component in our lineup. But the good news for me was, once we got in that into those playoffs, every game you win, you know, maybe you have a day off in between, it was given more and more time for this injury to heal. And I know it sounds as corny as Cinderella's ending, but it's the truth. The very first time that I told someone, told one of the coaches before the championship game, I said, I feel like I'm back 100% again. And that day, we play in on national TV in front of millions of people, playing the University of Miami. There's 30,000 people there, and it's the national championship game. One game, take all. And uh, it was a good game, back and forth. Uh, and they take the lead in the top of the ninth. And guess who's up to the bat with two outs in the bottom of the ninth inning, down by one run? I mean, I just don't think it was just coincidence, you know? And, uh, you know, I, I'll tell you this, the guy that batted before me had a great World Series, and he strikes out for out number two. And as he's walking by me, and I'm going up to the plate, he says, pick me up. And that's kind of our little man mantra we had. If, if, if one person wasn't able to, to be the guy to come through that day, that's okay, because somebody else has got their back. So our, that was going through my head. He wanted me to pick him up. A lot of people have asked me, what are you thinking whenever you step up there? Because really, it's two outs, bottom of the ninth. If I pop up there, strike out. But that first pitch I hit it, it's going towards that outfield fence. I'm running hard. I'm hoping it's a double, because remember, I can get to second base, and then I got the, the top of the lineup to hit me in. I hadn't hit a home run all year, you know? I think we set a home run record that year as a team. I had zero. <laughs> but as I'm running to first base, our first base coach, Daniel Tomlin, who goes to church with me right now in Alexandria, he was coaching first, and he jumped about this high off the ground. <laughs> so that was my first clue in. Oh, I just hit a home run. So I start getting excited. I'm jumping around. And then as I turn towards second base, that's when I see the entire Miami infield is on the ground like somebody opened fire on them. <laughs> and that's when it finally registered. We just won all. We just won the whole thing. So I start going crazy. I'm jumping around. I, I touch second base. And, and I'm thinking, well, if there's ever been a Kodak moment, this is it. So I put the number one finger up. You know, that's what gets on the front page of the paper. Get around third, you know, my teammates are waiting for me, touch home plate, and I mean, you're on the bottom of that pile. I didn't know I had so many teammates. <laughs> you can't breathe down there. I get up and there's buttons missing off my shirt. I mean, it's just, but I mean, that's what I played sports for. That is the reason I love sports. I never played for, I could care less about home runs and statistics, batting average. I played the game to try to do what I could do to help my team win. And even though I wasn't there for most of that year and I didn't do anything to help, I was able to have a part in that exclamation mark. And, uh, you know, that's the thing I'm most proud of. But I'll ask you this, in telling you that whole story, do you think that was just coincidence? Do you think it just happened to be me come up there? I don't think so. I mean, I think God had a plan all along. And obviously, He has a plan for every one of us. Um, you know, I... Today on Dad's Day, I just wanted to share with you three three things. You know, I, every day I get an email, and I'm, I don't get any money for them or anything, but I, I would encourage you to check it out. It's www.allprodad.com. Tony Dungy used to be an NFL coach. He's kind of one of the big guys into this. They send me a daily email, and um, I just, I kind of, I get a lot out of it, but you know, I, I kind of like the concept. So these three points I want to tell you is three, three keys to being all pro dad. Or, you know, you could be all pro mom, the same thing. Because I know my dad, he was very, he was a coach himself. And one of the things that he imparted in me was, you know, he didn't necessarily try to coach me all the time. He basically just wanted to be my dad. And the one thing that he would always tell me is, just compete. Just compete. You know, that was his way of saying, do your best. You know, Scripture tells us that in Colossians. It talks about, you know, when we, whenever we work or whatever we do, don't do it for man, but do it to serve the Lord. And I think if we look at life that way, it makes life so much easier. I'm not trying to satisfy somebody. I'm trying to, I have an audience of one. That audience of one is the only one I'm playing, working, serving in everything I do. So, 
here's the three things and I'll, I'll let you go. Number one is be present. Be present. Um, funny, there's a, there's a picture that hangs in my office. I didn't pick it out, but it's like a vase, flowers, and this where I work at the bank. And uh, if you were to ask me, like, what are the colors that make up that picture? I, I really wouldn't have a clue. You know, I, I see it every day, but I don't really see it. It's just kind of there. And I think if we don't watch it, we can kind of just be there instead of be present. So I encourage you to be present and be focused and ready whenever your kids come to you and they're in need. It's tougher today, I think, maybe even more so than when my dad was raising me because, you know, think about things like text and email. All these things are pulling our attention away from what's important. So number one is be, be present. Number two is be positive. Be positive. Um, I was standing talking to a friend of mine who coaches high school sports and he had a dad come up to him and his son was going to be a ninth grader and he was all excited. He would made the team and he started talking to him about, yeah, I know we need to work on this and this and this. And he kind of stopped him and he said, you know what? The best thing you can do, you just let me be the coach. He needs you to be his dad more than he needs you to be his coach. You know, and, and that's true in everything. It's very easy for us to find the things that people do wrong when we look. But a lot of times we don't look as hard to find the things they do right. So I encourage you not to be so critical with the things you see your kids. I know we all want them to be the greatest they can be and be perfect. But they also need you to tell them when they do things well. So be present, be positive. And then the last one is be proactive. I got this from uh, another friend of mine that leads a men's small group. He reminds us of this all the time. He says there's three things that you need to tell your kids every day. Very simple. Three things. Number one, tell them I love you. That never gets old. They always need to know that. Number two, I'm proud of you. And number three is, you're good at blank. You fill in what they're good at. If you tell them that every day, they won't have confidence issues. They won't wonder if how you feel about them. So I think if you do those, th those three things, just little things, you, you'd be well on your way to hopefully being an all-pro dad and, you know, that, that, like I said, it's great to hit a home run and come through in the clutch or uh, throw a touchdown pass, but whenever your kids come to you in need and you're able to lift them up, there's no greater blessing that God can give and there's no greater blessing that you can be for them. So enjoy the rest of your day. I appreciate you listening.